Welcome to part B of this lecture, which is uh, men's clothing in the Italian Renaissance and subsequently Northern Europe. Let's move on to Italy, shall we, or to, to the actual clothing. So we're going to do the, finish this section off of men's clothing. Here we have a gentleman um, getting ready for the day. He's got his basic undergarment, a white linen shirt with round neckline. This is a camisilla. As you can see, it's kind of like a long night shirt. And over this was worn, worn a doublet, basically a vest. And as you can see here, the sleeves are not usually attached. They're tied on in separate sections, upper and lower sections, with a bit of the camisilla blousing through. The hose comes in two parts as well, party colored, uh, separate pieces seamed at the, sometimes seamed at the crotch and attached to the bublet, doublet by points and then some slippers on. So this is where you would start out. Now, when you go out, what you're going to do over the doublet, you have a jacket with a short skirt, slightly flared like this gentleman with long sort of funnel sleeves um, there. You can tuck his hands in if it gets cold. You could button them down the front. Usually that button, I would say, but fastened with laces and leather. So a button could be kind of a misnomer. I better fix that. But more than likely, it's a pull on. Now, here's the thing. Because of the short length of that jacket or doublet, your genitals are not covered. <clears throat> Sorry, but it has to be said. So what are you going to do? You're going to take a little piece of fabric called a cod piece. And you're going to attach it there so that you are fully covered and modest to go out to do the day's business. Here's some more jackets, sleeve variations. You can see on the left a balloon jacket there. And then on the right we have a hanging sleeve with a jacket that is split right open to reveal the doublet sleeve and usually a fur or decorative lining underneath. One of the most popular sleeve styles, and when you watch period pieces now pay attention particularly with uh, royalty or rich people are involved um, slashing where the sleeve jacket was cut open the doublet allowed to come through you can see, so this is what this is this is the slashing just cut and then maybe have a garter tie ribbon tied off here and then um, there you go and then this is the doublet sleeve right here so slashing is a big thing. Also, we have these balloon sleeves tied on the upper arms, and these are really puffed sleeves. And you can see, interesting, let's do this while we're here. It's weird, but um, you can see the attachment of the cod piece. And really, it's just a little, I don't know what you call it, uh, just a little strip of fabric. And it looks like it's tied on to these two little hooks, almost like buttons. So I guess they are buttons. Um, but you can see his camisilla is showing through, really. It looks like a jacket It's because it's got that rough. But I suppose it's his doublet jacket. Okay. <clears throat> Some variations. Like I said, fashion, fashion, fashion. Uh, we have here a tabard-like jacket with rolled or pleated front. Interesting variation. This is here, these uh, slash, not really slash sleeves, but really like doublet sleeves where they're kind of tied off to the camisilla. Also by mid-century we're starting to see a skirt, a flared skirt. You can see the gores right here, right? With contrasting fabrics and a flare. And again here's some hanging, well that's the same picture, of course there's hanging sleeves. Here we see a robe, a short robe with a fur-lined collar and full slash sleeves on the left. On the right, worn by nobility a lot of times, a tabard-like cape emblazoned with the family's coat of arms. Hoopalon. Remember the hoopalon? Well, it is still worn. It's a little old-fashioned now. Think of analogy as an old-fashioned tux like white tie and tails, like Fred Astaire. That's kind of where the hoopalon is here. Nice lira pipe. It's a scarf now. Remember a lira pipe was a hanging tail, um, but here it can be a turban-like scarf. And you can see these are, you can't really tell, this is a separate robe or shirt, and then this part here with these hanging gores of contrasting colors it are the sleeves. And the high collar is gone. Remember, hoopalons in the Middle Ages had a high collar. So that's what happened to the hoopalon. Tabards, knights of noble family over armor would wear their tabards, as you can see here, in this pleated, rolled pleated um, velvet, and then girdled with a belt, mostly for formal occasions. 
And we start to see universities, libraries. Come on. So we start to see academicians such as ourselves. Now, imagine if you were, if you had to teach, um, you would have to teach every day in your graduation gown. That's basically it. This is, there were uniforms, and this is it. A long, dark robe with wide, long sleeves. Um, only other garments visible were usually the hose, usually black, and maybe the high color of a jacket or doublet, and then maybe a cap on the head and low, low sandal or low slipper uh, boots, shoes. But uh, that's what you would wear if we were teaching in the Renaissance. So, by the beginning of the 16th century, we come to see the height of fashion, particularly for young men. If you were a young man, a, a Borgia or um, a De Medici, or you worked in that area, um, you're going to be a bit of a dandy. So we see jacket's gone, doublet itself is slashed, and the fabric of the camisole is pulled through. Arms, back, front, longish hair, and then the hose, the jacket, since we have just the doublet, which is just a vest anyway, you can see the hose becomes more fitted and is almost always party colored. And you can see by this example, which is not too much of exaggeration, there's not a lot left. It's kind of yoga pants, period, for men <clears throat> there. But they still have the cod piece, so. Thank God for that. Uh, as I said, we will uh, veer off a little bit to France and Germany because they will start to, or Northern Europe, because they will start to see, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Influ inspiration from the Italian Renaissance. So by 1500, Northern Europeans had, adopt, Europeans had adopted Italian styles. The hub doublet and hose jacket ensemble. You can see here, this is um, King Philip Second, third, France. So French, you can see the painting, the taffeta, right? If you look here, you can see the sheen of the taffeta. Excellent painting there. Slash sleeves, you see the slashes of the camisilla coming through. So excellent example of a very fine uh, camisilla doublet ensemble. Germany, we fur line, it's north, it's colder, so you need it to be warm. So we get um, fur line jackets to provide warmth. Two linings that are popular, uh, ermine and vair, which is a gray scroll with a white belly. But you can see this is ermine, I believe, had these little dots, these little eyes, if you will, <clears throat> as a lining. Warm and fashionable. But here's the thing, right? They're padding up in the north, but they're still keeping that short doublet jacket combination. So here you see, here's a gentleman, he's German. Um, <clears throat> he's got a bulky jacket on. And then these little hose, so you get this really weird looking silhouette where you're sort of bumbling around top heavy on these little stick legs. So it looks. <clears throat> so it's a very distinctive um, combination, particularly with uh, English Tudor period, as you will see. <clears throat> so fur line jackets, puffed and slashed sleeves, hanging sleeves. And then we also start to see in the same time period the surplus neck neckline as it's known still to this day but we we might call it double breasted where one one lobe of a jacket overlaps the other so we start to see the surplus showing up you can see this is fur line so this is from gentleman probably from northern europe his hanging sleeves and his surplus neckline jacket now eventually following italian fashion northern europeans begin wearing the shorter jackets and also they're attaching a separate skirt known as bases. So you can see here, let's look at this, these German gentlemen. Um, this is the jacket. This is the jacket. Not attached to it are the bases. As you can see, we'll talk about the hose in, in more in a minute because I know that's a journey in and of itself. Usually lined and stiffened gores of fabric make up the bases. Now we also start to see more de we're getting into the 1600s more decorative hosiery the hoses made of two pieces and sewn together we have here we can see the upper section ending at or near the knee known as the upper stocks or breeches as we might come in you can see they're slashed and kind of gathered up and then more like socks really are the nether stocks 
often of contrasting colors, patterns, fabric, combinations, all sorts of things. So you can see the wild variance in decoration and the, the abundance, abundant variation of the slashing. Now, eventually, these upper stocks evolve around, will evolve into what is known as the trunk hose. By the time we get to uh, Tudor English, we will see a lot of that. So it's worn higher on the leg. So you kind of have here a jacket, a jacket with bases, trunk hose, and lower hose, known as nether stocks. Also, we start to see the codpiece directly sewn on to the breeches there. So you can see here are the trunk hose in this man's case here on the um, on the left. And so we start to see, because, you know, let's be honest there, people like to show off. Pardon my friends, it's kind of a pissing contest. So if, if Franz has a nice cod piece, Hans is one and one a better one. So we start to see more and more padded and decorated cod piece. Oh my God, yes, this actually happened in real history life. Now, by mid-century, and I'm talking here still about the 1500s, um, because of their um, taking the lead on the exploration of the New World, um, Spain becomes a ma the major power. Uh, they have a Spanish Navy, Spanish Army, the richest can be because of all the trade with New World. So we start to see the ascendancy of Spain and the Spanish style becomes more fashionable, both in Northern Europe and Italy. And you can pay attention. You can see when Spain's ascendant in many period pieces, um, particularly ones that are from Germany and England, this, this thing, it's characterized by two things, these dark jackets or dark clothing, really. Here's a man, um, king of Spain, wearing uh, a cloak and a jacket. Um, Contrasting silk embroidery, usually gold, on a back, black background, and usually in a vertical pattern, as you see here. And then high, stiff collars. You can see there how high and stiff. This is going to be uh, the precursor of the rough collar you will see in um, Renaissance England. Um, the Spanish are very Catholic, so they will cover up more. So none of this secular nonsense. Obviously, it doesn't apply to a cod piece, but come on, let's be real here, folks. Okay, here we see Northern Europe, fur lined uh, garments. Outer cloaks rarely went below the knees and were lined with fur. Upper class cloaks having here, you can see puffed and slashed sleeves as well. Incidentally, just as an aside, um, this is also the period, I believe, of the Little Ice Age. In Europe, so you can see, particularly in the north, that's why they have such heavy clothing because it's really cold. This is a French gown known as the Chamar, I think I'm saying that right. Chamar, Chamar. I forgot to write down the pronunciation notes, but I want to say Chamar. Usually richly brocaded, identical to an up standard upper class gown. You can see, um, and again, that strange silhouette, that bulky. The legs look even thinner when you have this really bulky fur-lined jacket. Here we see a peasant. <clears throat> Doublet, hose, jacket combination. Um, an interesting collar. We'll talk more about this later. Well, we talked a little bit about in the Middle Ages. Um, and then you can see here, he has single hose. These are his legs. You can't really, you might not be able to tell in this engraving, but his legs are right here because it's hot. And you just take his hose and pull them down around their knees. So he wouldn't sweat to death. And that is the end of part B. Part C begins with women's clothing of the Italian Renaissance and subsequently Northern Europe.